Now let's look at how efficient coding can help us to understand the forms of neural recessive fields. We will show a formulation of the problem and a general solution for the optimal recessive field when certain conditions are satisfied. Let's first review and set up the notations. Let S plus N be the receptor responses to visual inputs. Uh, they are both vectors, S and N, and S is for the signal and N is for the noise. The responses of the downstream neurons are O, so O is a vector. The receptive fields are approximated as linear, so encoding K is a matrix with matrix elements K, I, J. Okay. And NO is the additional encoding noise, it's also a vector. And OI is the response from the downstream neuron I, the I's neuron. And SJ is the J's input component. For example, it could be uh, uh, at, from a spatial location XJ. For example, you may have five input nodes, S1, S2, S3, S4, and S5. In that case, and the KIJ then describes this eyes neurons, uh, neural recipe field properties or input feature properties. So if input S is for spatial inputs, then K describes the neurons spatial recipe field. For example, if you have an output neuron OI, yeah, then KI1 is the effective connection from S1 to OI and then KI2 from S2 to OI and so on and so forth. And all these neural connections, the effective neural connections then describes the rest of the field for OI. And of course, if you have another neuron, then you will have another rest of the field. So different rows of K will describe different rest of the fields for different output neurons OI, yeah? And uh, SJ can also describe input at time instant TJ. In such a case, then the encoding transform K describes the neuron's temporal resistive field. And we can use this to uh, get a neuron's temporal response function. SJ can also describe visual inputs from different cones, so different Js for different cones. Then uh, KIJ then describes a neuron's color selectivity and color tuning. Yeah? And so also SJ can describe inputs from different eyes, so for stereo vision, binocular vision. So for instance, J equal to 1 for the left eye and J equal to 2 for the right eye. And then KIJ will describe a neuron's ocular dominance properties. And SJ can also uh, describe inputs uh, combining all these input feature dimensions. So for instance, SJ can be a particular space-time conjunction or space-color conjunction, etc. And so in such a case, then KIJ is a neuron's conjunctive feature tuning, for example, uh, for a neuron's spatial temporal recessive field that's combining space and time. So you can describe the motion tuning properties of the neurons or a, a, a neuron spatial temporal, a spatial chromatic tuning. So in all these cases, this general formulation can apply. And so let's first derive the general solution K uh, without specifying which input feature dimension we're referring to. And then we can apply the solution in various examples, specific example to get more concrete results and then to understand our uh, neural data and see if this uh, makes sense. For simplicity, we also assume that all the signals and noises have zero means, and so that can make uh, lots of notations and derivations a bit easier. If they do not have zero means, we can always do some transformations of our coordinate systems so that we can make uh, this is the case to simplify things. So we need to find the optimal matrix K to minimize this objective function EK. To do that, 
we need to first have uh, the probability distribution of our input signal P s. Okay. Um, for a vector s with many components, this means to get a joint probability distribution on many dimensions. And this is not easy, particularly when n is very large. For example, when n is the number of image pixels. Yeah. However, we can uh, more easily get another statistical property of the input signal. And this is its second order correlation matrix. Okay. And so this matrix is denoted as Rs. Okay. And it has this Ij's matrix element and the ij's matrix element is a second order correlation between the si node and sj node of the input okay and um, with uh, you can see that this is correlation is si sj and it's average over by the probability joint probability si sj and integral over si and sj okay and this is much easier for us to get as properties of uh, natural inputs. And with this uh, correlation matrix Rs, we can then approximately write the probability distribution as if it's a, a, a approximated by a Gaussian. Okay, In this Gaussian, you can see that Rs is still the matrix Rs. And now it's taken inverse. And for its uh, when it's after it's taken, it has the Ij's element. And it's added together uh, by the summation Ij, Si, Sj. And so this is a Gaussian approximation, Gaussian distribution of a whole uh, vector S. Okay, and this may look a bit complex, but we can see this special form when S is not a, a huge vector, but just a, a, a scalar. This is a familiar Gaussian distribution we are familiar with. Yeah, and in this you see this uh, quadratic S squared in this is now replaced by quadratic term Si times Sj. And uh, the variance of uh, the S in this form, sigma Si, is now replaced by correlation matrix. So a number variance is by correlation matrix. Yeah. And then, of course, you have to sum over Ij. So this is complex, this is familiar, but we can get a feeling that this is a Gaussian approximation. We will later show that this Gaussian approximation is not bad. It quite reasonably describes the statistics of natural inputs in many situations. Also, Gaussian approximation makes it easier for us to get analytical solution for the K-matrix later. Thirdly, this Gaussian approximation captures our ignorance about the true probability distribution, the joint probability distribution. Since it turns out that um, this distribution um, not only gives us the second order correlation correctly as data, uh, but it's also the distribution with the largest entropy while keeping the second order correlation uh, fixed. In addition, we also assume that all the noises are also Gaussian, um, although different components of the noises are independent of each other. Okay, that makes it even simpler. We additionally impose this quadratic form as the neural cost. Uh, it can be seen as the total energy at the output or the total output dynamic range. And it also helps us to get analytical solution K later for the encoding transform. Um, we know that when the input signal and noise are Gaussian, then the output O is also Gaussian. So first of all, we need to calculate this uh, summation of variances and also calculate this uh, uh, mutual information. And to do that, let's first of all get some intuition in our simpler case, which we are familiar with when the signal and noise are both scalars. So very simple, the sim simple Gaussian. And when uh, the output O is basically the summation of the signal and noise, we remember that in that such a case, uh, O is Gaussian with a variance. Uh, sigma O squared is just the summation of the input signal variance and input noise variance. 
and also when we cal calculate the mutual information, remember it comes out as simply a, a half of a log 2 of the ratio between the output variance and the noise variance. Okay, and so in such a case, this output variance then will be replaced by the summation of many variances at many output nodes. And uh, this uh, mutual information becomes that more complex mutual information involving uh, vectors. And so what's new here is this ratio here, okay, this ratio of the variance. So what's new here is all of these variances, here's variance, here's variance, here's variance. These variances will then be replaced by correlation matrix, matrices when we do this more complex calculations. And also the second element is when we're doing this calculation, we also need to put matrix K into the calculation. And that's all, okay? Again, we optimize transform k and to minimize this ek, and uh, we denote the variance uh, in each input noise as um, n squared in this symbol, and in each output noise by that. And we also remember that all the um, noise components are independent of each other and of uh, independent of the signal. Okay. Now let's calculate this output correlation matrix we denote it as RO and it has matrix element IJ is defined by this correlation between OI and OJ. Okay, let's then expand out explicitly. So OI becomes, is, is this one, yeah? It's K uh, transform over uh, the input signal and noise plus the uh, encoding noise and this its i's element and similarly for the j's element so we write it out and also let's uh, expand on our in detail so ks times ks so that comes to the first term ks times aks so this basically is the input correlation between the sa and sb and acted by k individually and also the noise term, noise times noise, so noise times noise acted by K. So noise times noise. And also the last two terms, the correlate this output noise with output noise, this output noise with output noise, the I's term and J's term. And of course, we can also do the uh, cross product between the S and the noise, right? So K as with noise. But remember, all these things are independent, so all these terms will go away. So I only just write out one term, the other terms all go away because different noise terms are independent, noises are independent of the signal, they will all go away. So continue, you find that the first term comes to this, okay? So correlation between the signal become this um, co uh, uh, correlation matrix of the signal. And the K, the first K come to this, the second K come to that. So this is in the whole matrix form when you sum over A and B, all these A and B components to sum together, it's this matrix form. And I and J come out this IJ element. And similarly for this term, we have all these noise correlation, they can only correlate with each other when A and B are the same because noises are independent of each other. So then this becomes the uh, the variant of a single component and then you come when a and b are the same it comes these two terms come to this matrix product and so this is just one number and this is the product of the two matrices and one is the transpose of the k matrix once the k matrix itself that's the ij element and similarly for this uh, this correlation can only be non-zero when i and j are equal to each other so it's delta ij now we have the variance of the output encoding noise, and this term is zero. So therefore this term comes to here, this term comes to here, this term comes to here. And so this is the IJ's element of output correlation matrix. And we'll write them down into the whole matrix form. So this whole matrix comes to this term, and this term, and this, this just means the unit, uh, unit matrix okay 
and uh, we notice that within this output correlation matrix, we have this is purely describing noise, and this is describing the, the signal. And so this is really the correlation matrix of the total output noise, which is the transmitted input noise plus the encoding noise, remember? Okay, so transmitted input noise is now convoluted by this uh, encoding matrix K, that's why it comes to this, and the encoding noise comes to this uh, unit matrix times the variance of the noise. Okay, that's the signal part. And so therefore, the neural cost, when you sum over all these output variances, okay, output variances really is the the summation over i, that means summing over all the diagonal elements of the output correlation matrix. So the, all the diagonal elements means the trace of this matrix. Okay, and so therefore the trace of that part put in here and trace of this part put in here, including the correlation matrix of the uh, output total noise. Okay, so this is the neural cost. And similarly for the uh, Neutral information, you can uh, show that it can be written as the log 2 of the uh, determinant of the output correlation matrix and the determinant of the noise correlation matrix, okay, put the noise in, okay. And I'll recall how this can be related to something we are comfortable with. Uh, the output co uh, uh, variance input to the, is equal to the uh, summation of the signal variance plus the noise variance. So the signal variance is now becoming here. Okay, that's the signal part, except it's convoluted by, by this matrix. And the noise variance becomes this one. Yeah. And similarly for this neutral information, now the, now the uh, uh, output variance becomes the determinant of the correlation matrix. And the noise variance becomes the determinant of the noise correlation matrix. And when these two matrices are diagonal, then the determinant basically becomes the multiplication of the diagonal terms. And this comes out exactly like that. And so the multiplication becomes the summation of the log because of the log. So this term comes to that term, and this term comes to that term. And how they look so similar with our simple case, yeah? And so that's how we get the intuition. This is how you map uh, uh, identify all these complex terms with a uh, simple understanding. So let's write uh, our results out here. So in this EK, we have this sum of the output cost. We just copy the trace uh, of this matrix over here. And we, for this mutual information, copy these results over here. Okay, so now we can do um, find our optimal k by solving this variation equation, okay, to find a solution to it. Since all these terms depend on k, right? This output correlation matrix depends on k, and so is the uh, noise correlation matrix depend on k. Now, k is actually a matrix with many, many elements, so to find the optimal k means finding all these elements. So that sounds like a, quite a complex task, yeah? However, there's a trick, and this trick is uh, by noticing a special property of EK. And it comes from this linear algebra theory. It says that if you have a matrix M, if you want to find its trace or determinant, and that's what we want, trace and determinant, yeah? And so these numbers, these values will be unchanged if you do a coordinate transform of the underlying representation so that this matrix really is uh, transformed to a new matrix by a unitary or orthonormal matrix multiplied from the left hand, left hand side and its transpose matrix on the right hand side. And these are the orthonormal matrix properties they have to satisfy. Okay, this is like an underlying matrix transform. So can we take advantage of that? Yes, we can. What we do is we just, for any matrix K that we're trying to find or not. Um, if you find its relative through such an orthonormal transfer, just, you know, original K and find a relative. And notice that this uh, UK transpose is equal to K transpose U transpose. And 
with that kind of a new k, you find that that doesn't uh, all it does is to make this upper correlation matrix into a new form, as if that's what we want here. Yeah, okay, this new form. And similarly, noise correlation become this new form. This is because each of these correlation matrix is wrapped around by k. So therefore, if you wrap around by k and make a relative of k, it's just like just adding the u on the outside wrap. Yeah, adding the u on the outside wrap. It doesn't change anything other than this. And this means our EK will not be changed if you just make a K do this kind of change. That means what if this K is actually a solution, optimal uh, transformation, optimal encoding? If that's the K that minimizes EK, so will all other relatives of this K through this U transform. Okay? And so we have a whole family of solutions that can all minimize EK. Well, that's a very good property we are going to take care, uh, take advantage of, yeah. So the plan is, let's first find a special solution K, okay. That special solution can minimize EK, but it's so special that it will keep the correlation matrix of the signal, RS, diagonal, okay. So once have, we have this special solution, then we can find all other solutions through such relative transformation, yeah? And so, but this is a special solution. And that's easier to find than any other solution. Now, why is it easy to find? Um, uh, we can, um, because this special solution is written as a product of two matrices. And uh, it's such that uh, the first matrix K0 is really a unitary matrix, like a coordinate transform matrix. And uh, it makes, or, or also a normal matrix, you can call it. Okay, it makes uh, this input correlation matrix make it diagonal. Okay, after you multiply this way, multiply this two side, flanking it. Okay, and uh, so this is really like, um, you know, PCA almost, you know, where originally you have this uh, uh, PCA transform. Okay, so make this uh, correlation matrix diagonal. After that, you can then multiply by any additional diagonal matrix. They will not, uh, uh, they, they will not change the diagonality of the, uh, the final result. Okay, and so therefore, uh, once it's already making this diagonal, you put any other diagonal matrix, it will still be diagonal. And with this special property, it's easier to solve for the solution. And once you have this special solution, you can get all other solutions. Yeah. So the optimal K is composed of three conceptual parts, as if it transforms the Gaussian inputs S plus N through three conceptual steps. Okay. The first step is the principal component decomposition. Okay, and this is fixed by the properties of the uh, input signal. It's statistics, in particular, it's a uh, second order correlation matrix, and that will completely fix what this uh, uh, transform K0 should be. Okay, and the second step is uh, have this diagonal matrix multiplying it. Okay, that means for each principal component, you just give a, a particular. Uh, uh, gain uh, the diagonal element to it. Okay, and the third step is to multiply by this uh, orthonormal matrix, which can be any orthonormal matrix. It doesn't change the ek value, but it's going to be useful for some other things. So, um, so the third step is free to choose. It's freedom to choose. Yeah, and therefore. And uh, what's left is really the second step that we can we have to determine what is the diagonal values in this diagonal matrix. So therefore, finding this E K, okay, uh, finding this K matrix becomes determining what is this diagonal matrix with its diagonal terms. And so therefore, rather than solve for the variations on K, you now variation to derivatives for for the diagonal matrix to solve this diagonal elements of G. And combining these three steps together gives us the total K that we actually want, which uh, the neurons, uh, neural networks in our brain actually build. Yeah. Now let's look at the conceptual steps of the K transform 
so as to see how we can solve for the diagonal matrix, this G diagonal matrix G. Okay, so now, given the original inputs S1, S2, S3, etc., first of all, you have this K0 transform, that's a principal component decomposition. After it's transformed, then all these original signals then become principal components, S, K. We use this different form to denote that this is a different S from that because it has a coordinate transform, like a rotation, coordinate rotation, okay, for different components, K equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And that's the first step. Okay, the second step is then uh, the diagonal matrix. It's for each component K, for each principal component K, we multiply it by a gain control GK, okay, that which is diagonal element of the matrix G, is a gain control such that you arrive at this output O. And now again, we use this output O with a different kind of font to mean that it's in this principal component space. Okay, this O is uh, gain controlled over the original signal and uh, uh, noise, except in this principal component space, plus this. Uh, additional encoding noise, which is also coordinate transformed uh, by this coordinate rotation. And you can even calculate what's its variance, so it's just now straightforward to calculate, yeah? So g squared, s squared, and the variance squares, and so on. Comes like that. And we can also calculate this correlation matrix RO in this new form, yes, OK, you know, O, OK and OK prime, we can do that, and you just multiply it out, plugging these things in, and you multiply it out. And of course, you can also just take the, the matrix and calculate the K, K prime uh, uh, component, and so this K matrix, we know that this K matrix will diagonalize this uh, uh, signal correlation matrix, so this will be diagonal, this is diagonal, and everything uh, is um, diagonal, okay? And that's why, uh, it will be equal to um, this variance with this delta function. It means all these OKs are independent of each other, which they should be because it comes from the principal components. And this includes the correlation matrix for the noise. Noise, okay, it's also diagonalized. You can see that it actually forms part of the output correlation matrix because noise is part of the output and comes from these terms coming copy down, this copy down, except just remove the signal component, okay? So when these correlation matrices become diagonal, then uh, they become diagonal matrix, then all of these components are independent of each other for different K. So for each K, it's as if, as if separate from another K, and then the objective function EK becomes uh, a summation of objective for all k's, okay? Each k is one objective, another k, another objective. So therefore, if we want to minimize this ek, we just minimize for each k separately. That makes it very simple. So you will write out all of these each k. It's now, it's, a, uh, it's just this variance. Originally, remember, it's a summation of output variance over many components. Now it's just one component at a time, okay, variance. And also the mutual information is also one component at a time. Uh, but, you know, as if this is just a Gaussian over another Gaussian, just like that. And so it's our familiar form of the output variance divided by the um, noise variance, okay? This output variance includes the signal variance, gain control signal variance and the noise variance, and now this is the noise variance. So it becomes a very simplified form, okay? And so in particular, you see this variance just copies down, okay? So this, this variance copies down, this depends on the gain gk square, and this mutual information, the output variance also copies this down on the, on the uh, numerator, okay? And the denominator coming from this variance copies down, okay? So it's very straightforward. So therefore, trying to find our optimal K becomes trying to find this optimal gain control matrix, which then becomes simplified into trying to find each of the diagonal element in this gain control matrix separately, separately, yeah, independent, yeah, separately from each for each K. That makes it very simple, okay? Just 
do the derivative of ek over gk. So ek depends on the gk in these kind of forms. And when you solve for it, you get your gk squared. In fact, you can just do derivative over gk squared because everything depends on gk squared. So this is gk squared, gk squared, and so ok squared also depends on gk squared. Okay, and so that you solve for it, you find that this is looking so complex, but this solving is, is straightforward. Okay, and this is the solution for gk. And you note that in this solution, the only thing that depends on for gk is the signal to noise for each k channel. Okay, so for each principal component, you have a signal power and noise power, signal power, and it depends on the signal noise. And that determines completely what gk should be. So now let's look at this solution gk is uh, how it depends on each of the signal to noise turn in a little bit more detail or can we have an intuitive understanding so this is the actual solution as how gk okay vertical axis gk squared depends on the signal noise okay and, and we order the signal noise in such a way that it doesn't increase but decrease so okay so as it goes this way signal noise goes more and more decreasing along the axis and the reason for you to do that is because the principal components usually order for by the first principal component first which has the highest signal yeah and the latest uh, principal will have a less and less signal so there's like a first second and third principal component this way okay and then we also notice that um, uh, this is depends on gk squared we notice that this uh, gk squared depends on two two multiplication of two factors. One factor is this and the other factor is that. So these two factors multiply each other, okay? And they have to be positive if uh, and big enough, larger than one. Otherwise, if it's smaller than one, it should go to zero because this gk squared has to be positive, okay? And so these two factors, I, I list them out here, copy them out here. And so this first factor, how it depends on the sig to signal to noise is, is this curve, this red curve and the second factor how it depends on the signal noise is that blue curve okay and these two factors multiplied together forms this black curve and that's the final uh, outcome for and multiplied together and minus one okay and form this black curve okay so let's look at this this curve first what is this curve this curve when the signal to noise is very high in the beginning, so this is almost zero, so this is equal to one. Okay, the one this is almost zero, this is equal to one. Always equal to one as long as signal noise is high enough. Until when the signal noise uh, become um, small, then this term become a bit bigger, yeah, a bit bigger. When this term become bigger because it's the inverse, it start to drop down. So what is this term trying to do? This term says, as long as signal to noise is high enough, I keep all your principal components, so when you are not high, the noise is too high, I start to cut you down. Okay, when the noise is too high, cut you down. So this is our smoothing term. This is our smoothing factor. Okay, don't cut the noise. Keep, keep going until noise is too high, I cut you down. Okay, now what is this term? If you expand this term out, this term, if you expand it out, you find that uh, it will uh, increase when the signal to noise decrease, okay? When this signal is too small, it will go increase. So this turn, it will keep growing as the signal to noise go decrease, okay? Just keep going, going. What it's trying to do, it's trying to amplify those principal components which has weak signal to noise, okay? And it's trying to do is, these components with weak signal to noise actually comes from very um, uh, decorrelated, you know, there's not enough correlation, that's why they have very weak signal noise. And that the first principle component comes from strong redundancy in the original original uh, signal space, okay? So this means it, it wants to get the very decorrelated uh, components, but ignore the very correlated components. So this blue turn is actually trying to do decorrelation, redundancy reduction, okay? And uh, however, uh, well, this term is trying to smooth out the noise. So you see that our general solution for the gain control function really is uh, 
having these two components. One is for decorrelation. This decorrelation is very, very strong, dominating when the signal noise, you know, th this trend of increasing is, is more or less, uh, you know, dominated because this curve, when the signal noise is high enough, it's flat. So it completely depends on that. Until when the noise starts to dominate, then this whole thing starts to bend. So you cannot continue decorrelating when the noise comes dropping start to this this red curve start to bend down and that's what happens and then so therefore uh, the solution automatically decompose into these two regions one is smoothing in a high noise region one is decorrelation so decorrelation when the signal noise is high enough and uh, when the signal is too low do smoothing and in the middle, you now you have a sweet spot where you may have your gain highest. Yeah, that's your peak sensitivity for your gain. And so for some uh, middle principal component, you'll have the highest uh, sensitivities. Okay. So now we know we have this uh, gain control matrix. So we have the principal decomposition and the gain control matrix. What's left is then the uh, unitary or orthonormal transform matrix uh, that we can have the freedom to choose so that we can have many many uh, different uh, efficient coding transforms or in the same family that can make uh, the EK uh, minimized and the choice of U is not determined by EK but it could be used to satisfy additional constraints such as um, maybe simpler ways of implementations or maybe saving some other cost of neural wiring and things like that that EK hasn't quite considered. And another thing I'd like to point out is in fact these three conceptual steps K0, G and U are only conceptual for our understanding of what's going on. They are not neural implementation steps because in the end this whole effective K is, is the final only steps that's net necessary. So you can go directly from the signal input receptor space to the neural space. For instance, this could be photoreceptors, this could be retinal ganglion cell in a single step of K. Okay, the effective K, that's what we call effective K. And it's uh, so, for instance, you can say, how about in the retina we have the bipolar cells and endocrine cells? This is not in here. Okay. And then you may wonder why are the bipolar cells and endocrine cells and the horizontal cells there. And they may be there for satisfying some other purposes, such as the implementation hardware constraints. An additional, pu additional purpose could be that you know, our K needs to be able to adapt it because the K is not fixed. It may change because uh, we might come to different kind of input statistics by going from daylight to nighttime and, or, or some other input correlation change and so on. And this adaptation mechanism must be able to implement it very quickly in the brain by some hardware uh, reasoning, uh, hard hardware implementation. So these actual brain's implementation uh, may have some other reason to have some intermediate stages, but um, are not included in this efficient coding transform. And so this is just to point out. And so in the rest of this efficient coding chapter, we are going to use this uh, a concept to apply to many special cases of uh, efficient coding domain. And we'll see that it's very powerful, can uh, explain many uh, seemingly unrelated data, both neurally and behaviorally. Uh, on the other hand, we can also review some cases where, where it is um, failing. And so those, uh, when it's not able to explain, will motivate additional uh, theoretical consideration for the uh, rest of the visual system.